This is part number five of a series that we've entitled The Christian Work Ethic. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we're simply going to briefly review the principles of blessing and cursing upon a nation and upon business. This has to do with an economy. And I would just like to point out that though some economists are saying that the economy of America is picking up, and it uh, certainly might be, you will remember that uh, the problems of the nations of the world regarding their economic situation is spread out over a 50-year period. And so um, times are going to get rough, and then they'll get a little better, and then they'll get a little rougher, and then they'll get better for a while, and then they'll get rougher, all pointing toward the time when the mark of the beast will be here, and the economies of the world will be controlled by Antichrist. But until then, there are some principles that are involved regarding business. Now remember, business and a national entity are part of divine establishment. And though we cannot enforce these principles upon unbelievers, the principles are like natural laws. They apply whether you apply them or not. And if you don't apply them or don't consider them, it's like jumping off a cliff with no parachute, no hand glider. You're going to fall and you will eventually crash. So these principles are like natural laws. They are scientific. They will work even though you might not consider them. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God says that if you, verse 1, hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord to observe and do all his commandments. Now, in the Bible, there are laws of free enterprise and national prosperity. And even though you may not be a believer, unbelievers can recognize these principles. Why? Because establishment is for believer and unbeliever alike. Now, verse 2, these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. If you hearken, blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, the fruit of your body, the fruit of the ground, the fruit of your cattle, the increase. Now the word increase is a capitalist term. You've made a profit. You've benefited. Uh, you've gained more than you've lost. And that's what it's talking about here. The increase of your cattle and the flocks, Blessed shall you be in your basket and in your store. All right, now, that's the principle. If you listen to and follow the scientific laws of free enterprise, you're going to come out on top. Any nation who heads toward communism or socialism or rejects the laws of free enterprise will eventually get in trouble. Now, you will remember that the Pope has said, and uh, he's, a, he's a fellow that you want to watch because he is very much uh, behind the scenes regarding the economies of the world. Uh, he doesn't like ca communism, but he doesn't like Western-style capital capitalism. What does he like? He likes democratic socialism. So he is not for free enterprise as it is in the Word of God. He's for socialism. And, of course, the Bible stands against any and all types and forms of socialism. But, again, we're in the, um, the place today where those that are popular are those who are saying, let's look to the government, let's look to Washington to provide us jobs and security rather than business and the integrity of the individual, you see. Socialism says, forget about that, man helps man. But the Word of God says, man stands upon his own two feet and is responsible for himself. Time and again, Paul says, work with your own hands. Paul says, work for your own bread. And Paul says, work for those of your own household. That's pretty clear. That's the Christian work ethic. But because liberals don't believe the Word of God and they're trying to bring about a utopia apart from God, they're using socialism. Well, what happens? when you're socialistic. Chapter 28, verse number 15. 
It'll come to pass if you'll not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe his commandments, that these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. (laughs) Could we say that in America today? Look at New York. Look at Chicago. Look at Los Angeles. Time and again, our cities are in trouble. Some of the major cities of the world, well, the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., the murder capital of the world, not just the nation. We're in bad shape. Why? Because we don't care about the, the proper view of establishment and so forth. We have no moral uh, foundation or anchor. Cursed are you in the city. Cursed are you in the field. Now, we have not come this far yet in America, but all you have to do is watch CNN News, and you will see nations that are hurting, people who are starving, the civil war in Eastern Europe, Russians who are, don't have enough, and especially the nations of Africa. Why? Well, these, these people have been fearful of witch doctors, They've rejected the gospel. They worship stones and trees and fetishes. They reject the true and living God. So the true and living God says, fine, cursed are you in the field. And they don't have enough to feed. It, it's just plain and simple. That's how it works. So, uh, cursed shall thou be in thy basket and in thy store. And we can relate to those things, though they don't, don't mean exactly what we mean by a a grocery cart and a schnooks or bilo, uh, still the, the principle is the same. You have enough in reserve that when you go there, there's something on the shelves. But reject those principles and you have nothing to fall back on. They're gone. Okay, now, we saw Wednesday night that there are two exceptions to um, these rules. The book of Job chapter 1. Follow the principles and you'll be blessed. Reject the principles and you'll be cursed. But now, not all mature, faithful believers have been blessed as far as uh, the totality of their life. You see, we, we have false issues today. We have evangelists get up and they'll say, if you just simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all of your problems will be over. <laughs> and people, wow, man, that's great. Well, what about Job? He did everything right. And that started his problems. When he did it right, he got in trouble. That, that was his problem. He was doing it right. You see, if he were carnal, part of the world, the world would love its own. That's what we're seeing today with the socialism, the world loving its own, providing for its own apart from God. I mean, that's where we are. But Job said, hey, look here, I'm, I know these principles of free enterprise, and Job worked hard so much so that, in verse 1, a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, that man was perfect and upright. He feared God and eschewed evil. Verse 3, his substance, and goes all the way down, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He knew what it meant to turn a prophet. And he was very, very rich. And uh, the reason that he was rich was because, number one, he did love the Lord, but number two, he followed the principles of free enterprise in the Bible. So he advanced, he profited. Now, liberals as well as Satan, despise anybody who is successful in any way under God's system. So under the concept of the angelic question and conflict, Lucifer charges into the throne room of God, and God says, have you considered Job? And he said, yeah, if you took away Job's blessings, he would not serve you. If you gave him hardship instead of all of that prosperity, he won't serve you. So, because of the angelic conflict, we have an exception to the blessing rule. Job did it right, but what did God do? He allowed Lucifer to remove his prosperity. It's for a test. All right? So, verse 13. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. There came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses were feeding, the Sabaeans fell on them and took them away. 
killed all your servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped. That's servant one he was left with. While this servant was yet speaking, verse 16, there came another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up your sheep. Your servants were consumed, and I alone am left to tell you about it. That's servant two. But everything else gone. Servant three. While he was yet speaking, the Chaldeans came out of three bands and fell on the camels, carried them away, killed your servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped to tell you. That's the third servant. While this one was yet speaking, he said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking. Now remember, sons and daughters were important back in those days. Because it was an agricultural economy, you had sons and daughters to help you. They, they, they were considered uh, part of your prosperity. They helped you build your empire, as it were. So, there came a great wind from the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house. It fell on the young people. They are dead, and I only am alone to tell you. Out of all of his servants, all of his assets, all of his prosperity, he lost everything but four servants and a wife but that wasn't a blessing, as I say. I don't, I don't mean to always point that out, but it, it's a divine irony that, uh, that uh, she le he, God leaves the wife, or lo rather Lucifer left the wife. He knew that uh, that would be a source of cursing as well. She was not behind Job in his Christianity, his faithfulness. Verse 3 in chapter 2. The Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered Job? There is none like him in the earth, perfect and upright, one that fears God and eschews evil. He still holds fast his integrity, though you moved me against him to destroy him without a cause. Now that's the exception to the free enterprise rule. Here was a man who did it right for God, but because of the angelic question, God allowed him to remove all the prosperity that he had for a test. So sometimes when you look at, at uh, someone, you have to be very cautious uh, about uh, uh, knowing the source of a so-called cursing. Job had done nothing wrong, though his three buddies uh, uh, evidently said, and his wife even thought, why don't you curse God and die and get it over with? But Job held fast his integrity. That's the one thing he had that wrought him double prosperity by the end of the book. You see, God always turns it around. If he takes it away for a test and you pass the test, he's going to give you twofold more when the test is over. And that's what he did with Job. So it's not always bad to hit the bottom of the bucket, so to speak, to be at the end of your wits, at the end of the line, uh, as was Job. He did it for a test, and that is the exception to the rule. But now let's go to Luke chapter 12. What about those people that are ungodly and yet they prosper? It is the principle of the angelic conflict again. If you pay deference to Lucifer, if you work in the world with the world, you know, the Lord said you're in the world but not of it. You become part of this system so much so that it's the, it's the success of the world that you're con more concerned with than the success of God and his system, then you're part of the world system. Love not the world, neither the, quote, things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you have to be careful because there's exceptions to the rule. Here is a fellow who learned the free enterprise system but he did not follow it to its logical conclusion, God. At the end of all scientific laws, God. Uh, scientific laws are consistent, you see. At the end, you always find a greater intelligence and you work back from there to God. But here's a man who enjoyed the system of, of profiteering, but um, he did not love God. Verse 15, Luke 12, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. You see, there, there is a, a, an end of the line in this spectrum of the Christian work ethic. On the one hand, you're to, you are to take 
uh, advantage and exploit the free enterprise system to profit. But if you profit and leave God out of the picture, if, you, if you're profiting and you're doing it illegally, then God is going to eventually judge you for that. But there's a certain time there where God allows these things to happen. Again, the angelic conflict. He spake a parable unto them, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I mean, this guy had a yield and a half. This I will do, pull down my barns and build greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. See, this is the false security of riches. This is the false security of riches. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy to warn them that would be rich, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God which gives us all things to enjoy. He didn't say, don't be rich. He said those who would be, that was the driving force and motivation of their life. They're, they're Christians, but they leave God out. I want to be rich. Okay, fine. Uh, but uh, if that's the driving force of your life, don't trust in them. What was this man doing? Trusting in riches. Hey, money can buy me anything. It can't buy you salvation, and it cannot buy you health. It cannot buy you one more heartbeat, and it cannot buy you one more breath. It can't do it. This man says, I've got enough for many years. I'm going to sit back and take it easy and note what God called him. God himself said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You see, he corrupted the free enterprise system. He took it to the other end of the spectrum. Both sides are illogical. If it's free enterprise and self-responsibility, then you must work. And those who don't work shouldn't expect to get something. But then on the other end, those who, who do work but leave God out, <laughs> they should expect to get something, and that's God's judgment, and that's just exactly what happens. So there's a, there's a middle of the road there. There are some perimeters, there are confines that you must go uh, by. Verse 21, so is he that layeth treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All right, let's go back to Psalms 73. Now we're going to look at a few verses here. We're going to be here and in Psalm 37 this evening too. So I invite you to come back for part six of the Christian work ethic. But we need to take a little sidetrack here to see the exceptions. Job did what God says, but seemingly was cursed. And here's a guy who didn't do what God says regarding spiritual things and seemingly was blessed. And every time that happens, Believers scratch their head and they look out there and they say, why, God? I'm better than they are. <laughs> Have you ever said that? Uh, how come they hit the lottery <laughs> for, for 4 million or 40 million? I know them. They're, they're no good. They don't deserve it. Uh, I should have hit the lottery. Uh, why did they win? Why did they get the award? Why are they promoted? Why do the wicked prosper? Well, one of the reasons that the wicked prospers is because the world loves its own. And two, because it provides a test for you. Note, verse number two, Psalm 73. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps well nigh slipped. In other words, he was on the brink of falling into a sin himself. Why? For I was envious at the foolish. Now, who are the foolish? God just told us. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which you've provided? You see, uh, literally, you can't take it with you, and that's true. But it's worse if your latter end uh, is in hell. If you're hereafter, not only leaves behind all of your possessions, but you lose your own soul. That's why the Lord says, what shall it, quote, 
profit a man. Capitalist word, free enterprise. What does it profit you? If you gain the whole world but lose your soul. So the psalmist here, Asaph, says, I almost fell because I began to be envious when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands, in other words, no, no pain in his death. Uh, he has all of the best uh, doctors, finest surgeons, uh, the best medicines. He's not hurting even when he dies. Strongest wine, <laughs> what have you. Their strength is firm. It remains firm all the way to the end when they die. They're not in trouble as other men. They buy their way out. They bribe the judge. Neither are they plagued like other men. They don't... They seem to have a silver spoon in, the, in their mouth, uh, handed to them on a silver platter. And oh, that's getting me upset. Their pride compassed them about as a chain. In other words, they're wearing it as a, a badge of honor. Uh, and he goes on saying this, Behold, verse 12, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase with riches. Now, for the remaining time, we're going to note verses 17 through verse 20. We're going to go back further in the Old Testament and get a little background, but I want you to see how this guy reconciled it all, Asaph. He said, I was at, I, my feet almost slipped into this matter of covetousness and envy and jealousy because I, I'm here serving you, God, and I'm a pauper. Uh, I'm well nigh to poverty, but you seem to provide my every need. You give me day by day my daily bread. And here I am complaining, though, because this guy has 101 servants bringing him food, doing his farming and harvesting and so forth. And here I am. I have to break my back with a sweat on my brow. Lord, it's just, quote, not fair. Have you ever said that? He says, verse number 15, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. That is, the generation that comes up out of all human history and says, even though I didn't have much in this world, it was worth it to serve God, and God has rewarded me accordingly. You see, if he starts complaining, he's, he's complaining against all those who will witness against him. That generation that, that is brought up of God and is totally rewarded and who says to him, it was worth it, though I didn't have much of this world's goods, it was worth it to serve God. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. This guy was really contemplating because he was stewing with jealousy. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Now this is verse 17. He stewed till he came to church. Now what was the church? The tabernacle. Well, what changed his mind? When he went to the tabernacle, he it says, and from that point I understood their end. Now the, the Hebrew is meaning their end hereafter. Uh, their judgment that's coming upon them. Their day is coming. And uh, I see what happened. Where? He saw it at church, at the tabernacle. What was the first and foremost, and of course, the most prominent feature that anyone could see at the tabernacle? Well, about the only two instruments you could see if you were not allowed, if you were not a priest and allowed on the inside, was the brazen laver and the brazen altar. He's considering the brazen altar. Verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in a slippery place. You cast them down to destruction. Now remember, he's seeing this at the altar in the tabernacle. How are they brought into desolation? In a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so the Lord uh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, shalt thou despise their image. Let's go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 27. Get this background and then show you what he was talking about. I was jealous, I was stewing. I was at the brink of coveting, 
questioning God, why, O Lord, until I went to the tabernacle and saw the brazen altar. Hmm. Now, what's the brazen altar? It's where the sin offerings were made and all the other ones, but um, primarily the sin offering. Now, you'll remember that the sin offering was two things. It stood for the substitute for your sin, if you laid your hand upon it, but it also stood for God's attitude towards the sinner who rejects. Remember, what happens to this sheep is what literally happens to the, to the person who disbelieves God. So, as I'm transferring my sins here to this, uh, to this sheep, and I see what happens to him on the brazen altar, I say to myself, hey, for those who don't transfer their sins, this is what's going to happen to them personally. I'm transferring my sins and this guy's dying for me. But if the unbeliever has no sin substitute, he's got to pay for his own sins. He's, he's going to suffer what this lamb is suffering. So keep that in mind. I, I stewed until I came to the brazen altar and says, ah, I'm not going to stew anymore because what's happening to that sheep is what's going to happen to them. All right? Verse 1, make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, the height thereof shall be three cubits. Now, again, depending on what a cubit is, 18 inches, 21 inches, 25 inches, it is anywhere from seven uh, feet, six inches square to 10 feet, five inches square four feet six inches high to six feet three inches high again depending but uh, you get the the general idea that they've got the uh, uh, a big square altar there now thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof his horns shall be the same make them or overlay them with brass Thou shalt make his pans. Now these are the receptacles to catch ashes and blood. Receive his pans to receive the ashes, his shovels, the basins were to receive the bloods, his, his, the blood rather, his flesh hooks and the fire pans. All the vessels shall be brass. You'll make for it a great network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings. Everything, of course, is made of brass. Thou shalt put it under the, the uh, compass, literally the, the perimeter of the altar, beneath that the net, the grate, may be even to the midst of the altar. So the priest had actually had to lower into the, the altar the sacrifice that was being made. All right, let's go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. Verse number two, speak unto the children of Israel and say, if any man bring an offering, now this is a sin offering, this is what we're talking about, that he saw that dissuaded him against uh, absolute covetousness against any of the rich people. This sin offering, what happened to the sin offering told him I should not be jealous against those who have more than me in this life because here is their final end. Here's what happens to them at this point hereafter. They have riches now, but they have to give it all up, plus they lose their soul. If you bring an offering unto the Lord of your cattle, of the herd, and of the flock, it's a burnt offering. This was the sin offering. You bring it of your own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. All right, let's go on down to verse 10. And if his offering be of the flock, so whether you've got um, a cow, whether you've got a lamb, uh, it doesn't matter, one of the cattle, one of the sheep, you still bring it to the Lord for a burnt offering. 
you'll kill it on the side of the altar northward. Now whether they killed it at the door or whether they killed it at the north side, here's what was uh, to happen. They would bring the, the cow or they would bring the sheep. And by the way, some of the large cows had up to three pints of blood. No, no. Three gallons of blood. Now, you'll remember that there were two million people plus in, in Israel. And they had to bring for national sins. They had to bring for tribal sins. They had to bring for family sins. And they had to bring for personal sins. If you simply had, for the families represented there, one million uh, of, the, of the cattle or sheep, and you've got three gallons or less, you didn't catch all of the blood, what would happen to it? Well, on any one day, they would offer hundreds of thousands of sacrifices. Now, I'm going to make a point here, and you're, you're, going, you're going to see it. He comes, and he lays his hand there, and he takes his knife, and he would slit the carotid artery, come across the esophagus, hit the other carotid artery, holding the head of the beast, and they would catch the blood, but the rest would spill out on the ground gallon upon gallon, sacrifice upon sacrifice from morning to night. The priest never sat down and the blood spewed from these sacrifices. All right. Now we come back to Psalm 73. And uh, because of our time, I'm going to have to cut this short just when it was getting good. huh? You all were basking in the blood, in the gore. Now, you're going to understand something. Until, verse 17, I went to the sanctuary, then understood I their end. Surely you did set them in slippery places. It is not mud-soaked ground. It is blood-soaked ground where literally hundreds of thousands of gallons of blood were spilled in any one given day. And he's bringing his sacrifice up, and there's the smell of death. There are the sounds of death. That's why you need a cattle prod to get some of them into the uh, truck, because they know where they're headed, you see. And you've got to hit them hard with that electrode to get them to go up into that truck. They don't want to die. There is death all around. And here are these big lumbering beasts and so forth that they're bringing up there. And what's the first thing that happens? They hit that blood-soaked ground and they begin to slip and so forth. And you've got to hold, blood is everywhere. And you've got to, and that's what he said. The first thing I saw is that they're standing in a precarious place. Because God has already judged others, it's a testimony that he's going to judge that beast. Because God has already sent others to hell, it's a testimony that God's going to send rich people there if they're not rich toward God, you say. He said, I understand. The reason I'm no longer coveting is because I see their end. The first, the first place God brings them is to the slippery places where it's round about the, the brazen altar. Slit their throat at the door of the tabernacle. Slit their throat at the north part of the altar. Take their blood, put it on the altar, and pour the rest of it round about the altar. The whole ground in any one given day was literally soaked with blood. And so therefore, that's the picture that he's looking at. The, these, these beasts can't uh, motivate uh, real well. They can't walk real well. They're sinking in the blood of God's judgment. And might I say that that's the picture that this man is painting regarding rich people who are not rich toward God. They're on slippery places. They're standing on the blood of others who have already been judged, and they too eventually, in other words, their day is coming. They're in line to have their throat slit to find the punishment on that brazen altar. And so therefore, he said, uh, I don't care how rich they get. I mean, they can be a... A uh, multi-billionaire for all I care, and for all the, the troubles that the one is having with his, all of his wives, you would uh, say that uh, perhaps money cannot buy love either, as well as happiness and, and uh, health and so forth. But you set them on slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? 
they are utterly consumed with terrors. Now, I've just got a few minutes left here. Let me just explain this and we'll come back and finish it this evening. In a moment, they're brought into desolation. After the sins are confessed, the beast's time has come, whether it's a, a lamb or a bull. Some of the sacrifices the priests kill, but with the sin offering, the offerer had to kill this beast. He saw his own uh, destruction there, but grateful for the substitute. But the rich has no substitute. And so therefore, the rich man, what happens to this beast is going to, is going to happen to the rich person who leaves God out of his life. Don't covet their position. They only have the riches for a short time. It's nothing compared to eternity in hell. Nothing. Don't covet them. They, they are brought in turn up to the brazen altar. They're waiting their turn, and eventually they start slipping in the blood of others. They're on slippery places, slippery ground. But it doesn't matter. You can't run away on slippery ground, and that's what he's saying. You cannot avoid the judgment of God. It's coming. It's coming. They're on slippery ground. They're trying to move, but they can't. Their feet slide out from under them. He lays his hand there, and in a moment it's over. Once you cut the carotid artery, once you slip the esophagus, there's no blood to the brain, there's no air, and in just a few quick seconds, the life of the beast is gone. And so therefore, he is telling us in quite vivid terms, don't you dare let your own feet slip, verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps well nigh slipped. In other words, he, he was falling into sin. Why? He was envious at the wicked and their prosperity. And he did, didn't understand. He was pained in his heart until, verse 17, I went to the sanctuary of God and understood their end. 